Hey, it's good to see you, Oz. So we're talking about Time for Truth, your book, was, which was written in the, uh, the year 2000. Uh, and I've only just read it. And I have to say, it was incredibly prescient, really. Well, you could see this coming some time back. I mean, the recent interest in post-truth came from 2016 when the Oxford Dictionaries you know, called it their word of the year. And then The Economist picked it up. I put it on the front cover. But the ideas go back a long way before that. I think they go right back, back to Friedrich Nietzsche in the 1880s. So I've been following this for a while. One of your focuses, uh, if that's the right plural word, uh, was around um, the uh, Clinton and, uh, and the Monica Lewinsky scandal uh, when, well, to cut it short, he got away with it. And you, you focus on that in, in the book. Uh, that was just the hook at that time. But of course, the problem is far deeper and wider than that. And you can see it in the Trump era very strongly. But I think it's the underlying importance that really matters. In other words, the philosophical roots and the very practical consequences in our world. Because put very simply, truth affects three things that are very, very practical. One is trust. And from marriages to families, right up to public life in our societies, trust is absolutely crucial. And without truth, you eventually cannot have trust. The second very practical consequence is power. If there's no truth, everything is power, we're open to a world of power-mongering, manipulation, bullying, and domination and oppression. And there's no answer to it apart from truth addressed to power. And that's incredibly practical. Nobody likes to be manipulated. And the third problem sounds a little more abstract. Without truth, there is no freedom. Uh, 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 Jesus says, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The fact is that freedom is not the permission to do what you like. It's the power to do as you ought. And that, of course, requires truth, character, and a way of life. So it sounds abstract, this post-truth idea, but it's incredibly important to our modern world. We, it, it seems to have, um, shall we politely say, come to our attention since 2016, uh, especially in, in ways which maybe it hadn't before. Um, is it too late to do anything about it? No, I don't think so. Those of us who are followers of Jesus, regardless of the numbers against us or the surrounding culture, we've got to live the way that we're called to by Jesus. And that includes living the truth. And the challenge of the biblical view is not just you know the truth, that you live in truth and you actually become people of truth. And that, of course, is incredibly difficult, but incredibly important in our world certainly for those of you, say, in the media. Because while, say, over here in the U.S., Trump has been charged of being responsible for much of the post-truth era, but his notion of fake news or unsupported allegations and various things like that, you can see it on all sides. And so it isn't just the president. You can see this uh, post-truth fake news spreading in all sorts of areas. In other words, the way you say something if you can make it stick, that's what matters, not whether it's true or false. It might appear, though, that, uh, that since his election, that, 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 that we have entered into a new era of uh, how uh, political communication is, 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 is done nowadays. Yes, but that, that is because of partly his astute use of the social media, including Twitter. In other words, he's attempting to leapfrog the mainstream press, including those that you've worked with, John, and I worked with brief, very briefly at the BBC. But he's trying to leapfrog that by using the social media, and it's done so astutely, and of course, they're fighting back. But I would argue that you see the post-truth impact on both sides, and it isn't just the president, something far, far wider than one person. And as I said, it goes back eventually to Friedrich Nietzsche, who argued in the 1880s that if there's no truth, everything's what he called a matter of perspectivism. As Nietzsche put it, there are many eyes 
So there are many truths in plural. There's no truth. But his more important critique is if there's no truth, everything is only power, which means the weak go to the wall and the victory goes to the strong. And that's incredibly dangerous. You're using quite dramatic language. Um, and you make the arguments which uh, underline that dramatic language. Um, and there are those of us now who are saying, well, what therefore can we do? Is it time to do anything more dramatic than we've been doing hitherto? Well, it takes right to oppose might, and it takes truth to address power. And we who are followers of Jesus, we are people who believe in truth, and now is the time for us to stand for it in public life, and in every area in which we speak. And so uh, this is an extraordinary moment for us. But my point is in the book, it isn't just public and political. And you have great examples like Solzhenitsyn, a one-man dissident against the whole Soviet Union. And his famous line, one word of truth outweighs the entire world. That's public, political, very, very powerful. But it's also in personal relations. You take the Me Too movement and the sexual harassment today, the alpha male without truth has become domineering and you've had all sorts of examples of unwanted aggression and even rape, think Harvey Weinstein. But it's also in personal relationships. I tell the story in the book of Pablo Picasso, whom Giacometti described as a monster because of the way his devouring ego ate up the women in his life his marriages, and his mistresses, the only one who survived him well, and some of them even committed suicide after his death. The only one who survived him well was Francoise Gillot, who said her secret in going in every day with Pablo was to put on, like Joan of Arc, the armor of truth. In other words, in personal relationships, as well as big issues in the media or in public life, we need truth if we're not to be bullied and dominated. Okay. So um, I, I appreciate that your book uh, goes into this subject in some depth, and I personally find it extremely valuable to do so. Um, and it, but but it, it, is it possible that, that a discussion on truth itself is now being politicized? Oh, absolutely. Oh, that, that stands for reason. If truth is dead and everything is power, Politics is one of the principal ways of using the levers of power. But politics becomes dangerous. Whatever you can say and make stick, even if it's totally false, that will go. As an example of that, when we start talking about it, it's uh, you're a truth, uh, Trump supporter or not a Trump supporter. You're a Brexit supporter or not a Brexit supporter. And what we're trying to do, what, what people are trying to do maybe is uh, well, what we want to try and do is focus on truth, and yet it's become politicized. How can we, how can we get away from that, do you think? Well, two? you're bringing in another issue. We're in, in an age of, you know, multiculturalism has led to identity politics, tribal politics, victim politics. And one of the impacts of that is people are put into, <clears throat> excuse me, people are put into categories. So you're a Brexiteer or whatever it is, or you're never Trump, but immediately you're judged by who you are and where you've come from. Yes rather than what you say. But for, again, for followers of Jesus, you look back to Wilberforce. You know, he broke with the politics of his day because he was independent, didn't matter which party you came from. The question is, what were you saying? Was it right and wrong, good or bad, wise or prudent, imprudent, and so on. And so people who are followers of Jesus are gonna get back to truth, to issues, to wisdom, and so on, and be known for it. And one of the essentials is we always give a hearing to everyone. One of the biblical ideas of truth is that there are always two sides to everything. You see it in the law court. So if one side puts forward an argument, you should be open to hearing what the other side says and then make up your mind. So Christians should be fair, issue-oriented, truth-concerned, and always out to give a hearing to everyone. And of course, love and respect the people with whom we disagree. Uh, you spend time in America, obviously, and you spend time over here as well. Do you, is there a difference in nuance uh, as re, in relation to all this subject in, in, in the different nations? Um, very definitely, because America comes out of a different revolution, the American Revolution, much more decisively biblical in its roots. But as it rejects that, 
and uh, all that we were saying about at the beginning is a rejection of that quite explicitly. If you look, say, at the sexual revolution, it, it's deliberately against two things, as they put it, religion, which means the Christian faith, and parents. And you can see as that triumphs, the differences between the U.S. and uh, Britain are becoming less and less all the time. And um, we're facing new technology. You mentioned yourself, uh, social media and so on. That, that's a, that's um, actually accelerated since 2000 when you wrote your book. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you and I remember when the saying was strong, the camera never lies. And of course, the camera can be made to lie today with photoshopping. There's an example recently where you had a recording, actually done in England, of the speech John Kennedy gave after he died. And you know, he was on his way in Dallas to speak uh, at a trade fair, and he never made it because he was killed. And they took all his speeches down to the words and intonation and put the speech that was written for him and then created it. And it, it, it's actually very realistic, it's slightly mechanical, but you can see how today you can impersonate anyone and the possibility for fake news, fake propaganda has never been more powerful because of the brilliance of our technology. So the basic problems go back to philosophy and sociology intellectually. But now they're coming out through technology. And again, this is incredibly dangerous. We're living in a world of lies, hype and spin. And we need Christians to be people of truth. You're saying power is something that we, we could focus our energies on, on unpacking, speaking about, speaking truth to it, or is it, am I right? Is, that, is it that? No, you're exactly right. And you remember the most famous saying on power is by a Christian, Lord Acton. All power tends to corrupt. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. In other words, with power, most people look at the obvious impact of power. Power oppresses the weak. And the prophets are very much against that. But the real problem of power is not only that, power corrupts the powerful. And that's what we see working out in politics, even in the Western world today. So we've got to stand against that. There will be a slow corruption of power in the Western world unless there's a restoration of truth. Strikes me it might be a fast corruption of power. Well, an accelerating corruption of power. Accelerating, sure. yes. <laughs> No, as many of these ideas go back to the 1960s, you know, that was when they started to enter the mainstream of public life. So by slow, um, it was in 1968, 50 years ago this year, and you are old enough to remember that, that Rudi Deutschke called for a long march through the institutions. In other words, Marx wanted a revolution in the streets, and he was wrong, never happened. And it was Gramsci in the 1920s, writing from jail in Italy, who called for cultural hegemony. Question is, how did you do that? And Deutsche said, we needed a long march through the institutions. And the three primary ones are the universities and colleges, number one, the press and media, number two, and entertainment, number three. And then you can see over 50 years, very clearly, certainly in the United States and many other Western countries too, the left liberal ideas, which are closer to the French Revolution and decisively anti-Christian, anti-biblical, they have basically won in those three spheres. The Long March has been successful. Yes, well, you, you talk in, in your book about uh, uh, that third position that's needed with faith, community, and, uh, uh, and the Jewish and Christian faiths representing that third position. You, you make, a, you make a, an argument for that. Well, the English-speaking countries, Britain itself, the US, Canada, Australia, they really go back to what was once called the ancient liberties of the English, as Churchill would have put it, but they were enormously reinforced by the Reformation. And the Reformation gave a characteristically biblical view of freedom, and it's still there. But you can see many of the ideas, even in the English-speaking world today, Go back to the French Revolution and its heirs, such as Nietzsche and Foucault and others, and they, they move in a very anti-biblical and a very different direction. So I wouldn't use the words right and left, but they have different views of freedom. And I think true freedom you can't have without some of the biblical foundations. So that's a much longer discussion. Well, uh, two questions related, really. Let's first of all, um, 
the, are, the, are the plans to reprint the book to to re-release it because it's so well nice. yes you said it's out of print uh, i'm thinking of revising it slightly and expanding it a lot that's my next question. clinton that's stuff right. yeah, yeah. Uh, but the trump stuff will be as out of date very soon as the clinton stuff is now but the underlying argument of the book is is, is spot on today and i think more relevant than when i wrote it. so so what what would you revise then if you were if you were writing it now apart from the current affairs well i just cut out a chapter on clinton the rest of it i'd expand i would add a chapter uh, i would expand i would add a chapter on trust we haven't talked about that but there's a huge discussion today public life marriages business you can't have any of these flourishing without trust well trust comes from people being true to their word truth is incredibly important to the what's called the social capital of trust. Then I think I would expand the notions of uh, without truth, there is only power, because that's become more dangerous. One of the, the mysteries of history is why there isn't a greater outcry against the ruthlessness of power in history. And the fact is that the Hebrew prophets, Amos, Hosea, Micah, and so on, they are some of the first passionate voices on behalf of truth and justice against power in its ruthless form. And in a post-truth era, as Nietzsche predicted virtually, we're in a dangerous world of the strong man, the superman, and we can expect far more bullying and domination if we don't stand against it in the name of truth. Okay, well, I'm really sorry that you're not able to be with us around the table for this discussion, I was but, uh, Well, when I heard of what you're doing today, I'm deeply regretful that I'm not with you. And I'm glad that you picked such a vital topic for this first discussion. And I hope you have a fabulous day together. And I deeply regret I'm not with you.